Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show, Colorado Business News. My guest today, Colorado Secretary of State, Wayne Williams. Wayne, thanks so much for joining me. Aaron, thanks. Good to be here with you. Yeah, it's good to have you on the show again. So uh, I've got a lot of questions about the office, of course. Let's start off with uh, what, what do people not know about what the office does? And, and talk about some of the major functions first, maybe. Well, I, I think most people are aware the Secretary of State oversees elections. That's where it tends to get the publicity. It's where the news articles are. But a large part of the office is actually dealing with the business and licensing area. And so if you establish a business, and we just recently passed 600,000 businesses and business entities registered in the state of Colorado. Now, they're less than six million people. It's about one for every nine people. Uh, those entities vary from corporations to the little LLC that someone sets up for their own company or nonprofits. And we've got lots of nonprofits that we also play a key role in, in a number of ways. First, you have to register with us. If you solicit, uh, so if you engage in charitable solicitations, you register with our office. If someone's soliciting you, you can go to our webpage and you can find out how much of the money that they collect actually goes to the charitable purpose they have espoused. And so you can find out, is the money really going where it's supposed to go? Uh, most of our charities are very good in this area. One of the other things we offer is training for nonprofits. And so so if a friend asks you to serve on a nonprofit board of directors because you like cats or dogs or, or some a park or some other great cause, and you're going, well, what does it mean to be on the board of directors? We have training online for you to find out what's involved in being a member of a board of directors. How do I do that? How do I discharge that function? And so that's all available for free on the website. Uh, you can also become a notary public. And so if you're a notary, uh, you can go to official training training, but you can also go online, and we provide that training online. We try and make as much as possible accessible to Coloradans without having to come into the office. And in fact, we became the first state in the nation to offer the ability to you as a business entity to print various certificates, notices, proof that you are who you claim to be when you go in and visit with your bank. And you can actually, other people can do that as well. Other people can go on, they can find out, are you legit? Speaking of which, one of the things that we do offer that more businesses need to take advantage of is we offer a security feature on our website so that you can lock your data so no one else can change it. Now, it may sound odd that someone might want to go in and change your data, but picture someone who wants to to do wrong, they go in and they change where the address is, who the registered agent is, and then they try to get a loan in the name of that business that's been very successful and has a good credit rating. And so we offer an ability on our website for businesses to lock their data so that no one else can come in and change that. Is there a charge for that? It's free, absolutely free. We okay. try and make it I, I, easy I got, for people to do. I gotta tell you, I wasn't aware of that. Um, that's, a, that's a great idea, especially these days with uh, given cybersecurity issues and everything else. Um, so how many transactions, do you have any idea how many transactions the office actually processes in a day, a month, or a year? You know, in, in a year we're probably engaged in, in upwards of a million transactions uh, with uh, various business entities, with campaign finance, with candidates filing affidavits. Uh, there's a lot of involvement from all sorts of different areas and our goal really is to help people live that American dream and provide common sense solutions in doing that making it easy for people just like you said you weren't aware of that option to to lock your data on our website we do that for everybody we've we've tried to push that it's one of the things I wanted to mention on the show because we want more people to take advantage of that to get that protection okay well I'm on your mailing list uh, for you know an entity I'm involved with uh, I'm also on nonprofit boards and things things like that. But uh, I've never gotten an email that says, hey, you have this option to lock. So use your email list and uh, tell, tell those 600,000 people that, uh, hey, you can do this. We actually have sent that in an email to those entities, uh, but not everyone reads every email right, they well, get. I, I, won't, uh, I, I, won't, I won't contest that. I won't get to, I mean, with, with it, when you get seven or 800 uh, emails a day, you might You're miss. You're a popular guy. guy. Yeah, well, that's because I owe so much money more than anything else. All right. 
What about te technologically? What you know? You've been, of course, your county clerk uh, in El Paso County. What's happened technologically, uh, not just in the the voter arena, but also on the business side that you've seen, and, and where are we headed? Do you think? So on the business side, we've seen a lot of improvements. The Colorado's usually led the nation in having things available online for people to register, for them to be able to print, for them to be able to do training, uh, because we're a big state, and we want people, whether you're in Cortez or Sterling to be able to access uh, the information that we have and without having to come into Denver. Um, we have also tried to get public data available to regular citizens. And so one of the things we've done for the past couple years is we've sponsored a competition called Go Code Colorado. And in Go Code Colorado, uh, we bring together a bunch of app designers and they all get the chance to compete to develop a, an app that uses public data and makes it better for the public. So the last, the three winners this last year, uh, one of them was matching mentors with students who might be interested in having someone to help them two other the other two one address transportation needs to say can we incentivize you to drive I-70 a little bit later or a little bit earlier uh, by offering by have, working with businesses to offer a discount or some other option so you're not all driving on the same time and the final one was designed to be a social media posting that allows someone to pick uh, their choices of what they might enjoy and then share that tourism uh, option. You know, I want to ski in Aspen in the morning and then go to this place in the evening or the next day do this and they can share that online uh, with the idea that uh, we want to encourage people to come to Colorado and take advantage of our great resources here. All right, well when they come to Colorado they drive so maybe you'll give them the driver's app too at the same time. The goal is to try to improve it as best we can using that public data uh, and it, it's actually been, won a number of awards not just from government entities that did win the National Association of Secretaries of State Ideas Award. It was the second time in a year we won that award. Uh, but it also won the CIO 100 selection. Now, CIO Magazine has all sorts of folks, and I was down at the awards ceremony, and, and there were you know, all the big companies, the FedExes, the Krogers, and all these, and the Colorado Secretary of State's office. Uh, and so it's good to have that achievement recognized in our desire to use technology and make it easier for Coloradans. Is, I'm curious, has the driver's app really been used, the idea, because I tell you, driving today to the studio, evidently no one was using the app because everybody was on the road at the same time. So this is the initial development part uh, that was the competition, and now it's in full development and we hope to have it out soon. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I hope everyone else uses it, so when I drive, I don't have <laughs> the kind of challenges that I had today. Well, and, and you know, if you live in Colorado, you know some of those things. So you don't say, "I'm going to leave uh, Vale at." 4 p.m. and expect to get to Denver by 6 p.m. On so a Sunday. On a Sunday. Yeah. You say, I'm going to leave early, I'm going to leave late. And so uh, the idea with this app, for example, is to say, hey, traffic's bad. This place is offering a discount. Why don't you come off and shop or have dinner or have a cup of coffee or whatever the case might be. All right. That's a, that's a great idea. I, I like that. Speaking of driving, you're, you're doing an incredible commute. I mean, talk about commitment. You, you're, you, you live in Colorado Springs. Are you making that drive every day to the office? Uh, or are you able to work remotely once in a while? Once in a while, I'm able to work remotely, but most days I am making the drive to Colorado Springs. Sometimes I'm able to use the bus tank, uh, but for that to happen, the schedule has to align and I have to have nothing before or after. So I usually leave the house about six in the morning. Uh, that gets me to Denver, usually ahead of the rush hour. And then I'll either stay late, so I go to an evening event uh, and go home after the rush hour is over, or some days I'm able to sneak out like at 3.30 and get home by five. All right, well, I, I'm impressed with your level of commitment. So uh, we're going to take a break, and we'll be back in just a little bit with Wayne Williams, our Secretary of State. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. For information about the program, who our upcoming guests and topics are, and ways you can participate, please go to our website. That's harbortv.com. And most of all, thanks for watching. I'm Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland. 
Hi, I'm Jim Cameron, director of Avatar. I'm Christina Johnson, former Undersecretary of Energy. Hi, I'm Oliver Stone. Hi, I'm Mike Peters. I'm the creator of Mother Goose and Grimm. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show. I would encourage you to watch the Aaron Harbor Show. It's good fun. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show, because he's a really cool guy. Please watch the Aaron Harbor Show, on which I do appear. I want you to watch the Aaron Harbor Show. Grimmy watches it every day. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter and find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Your opinions, ideas, suggestions, and criticisms related to guests, topics, questions, or the host are welcome. Please send an email to producer at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We're with Wayne Williams. Wayne, you were county clerk, uh, and when you were county clerk, you had a lot of different opinions that uh, I, I think it's fair to say weren't always in the majority. Mm -hmm. Now you're working with 64, all 64 county clerks, including your successor in El Paso County. How has that experience been so far? You know, it's been really great. Uh, we don't often choose as Secretary of State someone who has actually run elections at the county level. And so I've been out visiting with all of the county clerks uh, before the election, I visited all 19 of the new county clerks. I'm finishing the rest of those up in 2016, all before the presidential election. Uh, and it's been a long time, actually, since the Secretary of State has actually been in each of their offices and talked to them. Uh, I understand what it's like, and I understand what those challenges are. And so we've actually been able to establish a really great working relationship with each of the county clerks across the state. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I think for them, they've got to be happy to have someone who understands what they have to do. They are. And it's been really fun, whether they're Democrat or Republican, the, the reading, the reception I've gotten in each of their offices has been phenomenal. Uh, they're excited to have someone who knows a little bit about what their life involves and who is sensitive to those issues because it's not easy uh, handling both motor vehicle registrations, recording, marriages. Oh, and there's an election every once in a while that's really kind of an important deal, but it's not what some of them spend every day doing. Let's talk about voting machines, because that's something that all the clerks have to deal with. Uh, what's happening in terms of technologically in, in that arena? And uh, and we'll put a map on the screen in a minute, where uh, because one of the things I think people don't understand is different counties ha often have different voting systems than what you in your own county experience. I think all of us, because we only vote within our own county, always assume oh, this is how everybody votes, and it's not true. But let's talk about technologically what's happening. So after 2000, when there was the debacle in Florida with the butterfly ballot and, and things not uh, very transparent, and then people trying to change results after they came in, uh, can I shake this enough so a different Chad falls out? Uh, Hanging Chads. Congress said, and the president said, that's not what we want to do. And so they passed federal legislation to provide funding for new machines. And in the rush to do those, most of those were based on electronics and based on Windows systems, often uh, systems which are no longer supported by Microsoft. And so the Brennan Center uh, came up with a study recently uh, that said there's a serious crisis in America because a lot of the voting machines are old. Sometimes the calibration gets off on older machines. And so there's some issues. Uh, we also have the challenge in Colorado that every county made their own decisions. And so if you look at that map, you'll see that Elbert County is the only orange county on there, kind of in the middle of the state, just southeast of Denver. All right, we'll, we'll put the map up right now so we can see what, uh, what you're talking yeah. about. So what the map shows is essentially each color represents a, a different system or a different vendor. That's correct. Uh, or a different combination of systems. And so Elbert County twice in the last six years has had a complete turnover of their county clerk, their election staff, and every 
everyone else involved in the process. And so this county, which has a unique system that no one else has, uh, has had this complete turnover. And the new clerk came down and met with me when I was in El Paso County, and we were trying to provide some help and assistance, but we use a different system, so we weren't able to do that very well. So that's one of the challenges Colorado has as well. So in November, this past uh, November election for all the school boards, we said, let's try out different systems. Instead of just listening to a dog and pony pitch or, you know, this little two hour uh, PowerPoint presentation <laughs> about how wonderful a new machine is, we said, let's try them out. And so we tried them out, each of the systems in a large urban county, and we tried each of those systems out in another county off the front range with the goal of finding out how they really worked and what was best. And then based on that, we're going forward with a plan to make it so that Colorado's next generation of voting systems is better, is more unified, and has the ability so it works well for voters. They're also, Aaron, much better on uh, accessibility for voters who might have a disability. Um, and whether it's a visual disability or a physical disability, they are much better at providing that. And then for people who do vote in person, they all print out an actual ballot. So in the past, some of those machines uh, were simply retained electronically as to what the votes were. In this case, it's simply a ballot marking device that prints out a paper ballot, so it's very easy to verify the integrity of the process, which is really important. We have close elections in Colorado. We want to make sure that everyone has confidence that the systems we use are accurate and that the election is conducted well. Does it make sense for every county to have the same system? You know, one of the things we, we experimented with in this pilot election is do they work in both large counties and small counties? So if we can get a system that works for all of those, it does make sense. Um, but there's the possibility that someone could say, well, it doesn't work for me. So uh, in October, I went out to Kiowa County. The Kiowa County is on the Eastern Plains. They hand count their ballots. And so they count each of the ballots individually by hand. So they don't need the same type of system, perhaps, that a Denver or a Colorado Springs might need uh, in their county governments. One of the things I think people don't also understand is the expense. The cost of new systems can be, you're talking in certain counties, hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions of dollars. How do we, how do we address that? So we're hoping that the cost ultimately will be less than a million, in any, in, even in the large counties. One of the ways we address that is a lot of the new systems also are now much better about using commercial off-the-shelf products. So instead of designing a custom scanner, and then requiring a county to build this, by the scanner that there are only a few hundred of in the country, they are accessing commercial scanners that you can buy and then they're using software to make those adapt to the elections process. That has a number of advantages. First, if they're producing thousands or hundreds of thousands of a product, they're able to do it at a much cheaper cost. And secondly, you can scale it to the size of your county. So if you want a scanner that does uh, 400 an hour, you can find one. If you want one that has a substantially faster throughput, you can find one of those. And you can access additional throughput by adding an additional scanner. And so it gives counties a lot more flexibility and at a lot lower cost than was previously the case. Are we ever going to see voting by uh, on the internet, do you think? So voting on the internet is something I'm very wary of. Uh, there are a number of issues you'd have to resolve. One of those is who is actually on the other side. Uh, another of those is how secure is that transmission back and forth. Colorado does allow a military member who's serving in Afghanistan, for example, to electronically mail back their paper ballot. So they scan it, they send it back, and then it's counted in machines that are here in Colorado. But the idea of internet voting like you might do for American Idol or something else like that is not something we're ready for. And I think it's a long ways away because of the security issues. We do financial transactions all the time online, but for those transactions, the entities are willing to accept a little bit of risk. Uh, so they're 99.5 or whatever the case may be. In an election, we demand 100% accuracy, and we need to make sure that those ballots are exactly 
as the voter intended them to be. You know, we've had elections. When I was county clerk, Aaron, we had two elections where a single vote made the difference. Uh, and that was after the recount and all of the processes, there was a single vote that differentiated the two candidates. We've had another election that resulted in a tie. Uh, and so it really does matter. And every single vote has to be accurate. We're not ready yet online. We might never get there. I don't know. I, I have a lot of confidence in technology. My grandfather, when he was born, if you wanted to go someplace, you got in your horse and buggy and traveled there. By the time he passed away, we'd landed on the moon. So certainly things change over time, but we're not there yet. Okay. All right. We're going to take a break and we'll be back with Wayne Williams. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of the Aaron Harbour Show. We depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's and world's top opinion leaders. Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax-deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to allow us to work for you. To find out more or to make a donation, please go to dmefd.org. Thanks for watching the show and for your support. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter and find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Your opinions, ideas, suggestions, and criticisms related to guests, topics, questions, or the host are welcome. Please send an email to producer at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. This is part one of a special two-part series with our Secretary of State, Wayne Williams. So make sure you watch part two as well. So Wayne, we've been talking about voter registration. Um, a couple things. One is the voter registration lists are accessible to the public or to anyone, basically. Is that a fair statement? Yes, they are. Uh, there are some provisions if you have a legitimate concern for safety where you can become a confidential voter. But for the most part, they are available to the public. And part of that is is a check on the integrity and the trust of of the situation and of, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Start just okay. a part of okay. that is, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> if I get you laughing, that'll be bad. Right. Just, I mean, you were saying okay. part of that is yep. based on the trust of, yep. say that. One of the other key parts in an election is you want to have trust in the integrity of the situation. And so you want to know who voted and you want to know who they are. So you don't want the government telling you, trust me, thousands of people voted for me. I won't tell you who they are, I won't tell you who voted, I won't tell you if your neighbor is one of them or not, but there's a lot of people who voted for me and you really ought to believe that. And so one of the things that is that American democracy is based on is you have the ability to check and you can say, hey, my neighbor told me they're not really a citizen or they've already voted in a different state where they live and, and they're a Texas resident so they don't have to pay income taxes. But I see on the voting list that they voted here. And so I think there's an issue. I think I ought to bring that up with the clerk. I ought to bring a challenge. I ought to do something about that. And so you can check. And if someone says, hey, th there were 4,000 votes cast in the election and here the 4,000 people are, and then you go back and you find out, well, this person doesn't live here, hasn't lived here for 20 years, this person's dead. That allows you to check and ensure the integrity of the system. Now, Colorado has a great system. We check death records and we compare that. We check incarceration records. Uh, we check postal address changes. And so we're able to maintain very good lists in Colorado. But part of that is that open integrity so the public can ensure the integrity of that system. The downside of that is it means that someone else can get that information. And so sometimes a campaign or a third party group will send out a mailing, your neighbors will know whether you voted or not, uh, in, in an effort to try and encourage people uh, or persuade them to, to cast a ballot in, a, in an election they might not otherwise vote in. Or to not vote. Or to not vote. And so 
one of the things that, that's a downside is that is public information. Not everyone who uses it has to clear it with our office or the county clerk as to how it's used. And, and so that because that information is available, folks can use it. I, I will note that we, so publicly information includes a year of birth that does not include a date. Uh, it does not include a full social security number. And so there's a lot of things that are protected from that disclosure uh, to try to ensure the integrity. The reason we allow the year of the birth is so if Aaron Harbor walks in and, you know, he's got a cane and he looks like he's about 93 years old and he stormed the beaches at Normandy. You can I, say, I've been accused of all those things. So. I, you know, I don't think this guy is actually Aaron Harbor. Or if, or if a 19 year old walks in, you can look at that and you can say, as a watcher, as someone who is part of the integrity of the process, I can bring a challenge and say, okay, this voter list says Aaron Harbor was born in, we won't disclose that on the air here, uh, but uh, he doesn't look 19 to me. And this this 19 year old probably isn't that. How individual. about 42? Could you say 42? You might. That might, might work. Get away you know, with that it. might what, be a hard why, challenge to break. Why why disclose any part of a person's social security number at all? So the social security number has to be given to us. It is not disclosed to the public. Uh, so that part of the social security okay. number is not disclosed to the public at all. Oh. But the individual voter has to disclose it to us, and we do that so we can check and make sure if we've got two Aaron Harbors, is this the same person we can sure. compare to the social security. Or if that person dies, it's obviously in death records. So, what so I've got a name, Wayne Williams. Uh, very, I, very uncommon, very rare name. It's a very rare name, and so I was listed <laughs> as Wayne W. Williams on the ballot because Wayne Williams was a child murderer in Atlanta 30 years ago. <laughs> ago and that's what an internet search gets well you want to make sure that you know if you say well Wayne Williams died is it the same Wayne Williams and so that's why our office or the clerk's offices need to have some additional identifying information but we don't provide that to the public so what can a commercial firm do what kind of commercial uses can be used with this information and if I wanted a copy of the entire uh, list the entire database uh, what would that cost me what, what do you what would you charge for it's, that it's a very low price it's, it's a CD that, or a, a thumb drive we can give that very easily it's less than a hundred bucks um, so so for $100, I can get the entire voter registration yes. list for the state of Colorado. And you can get... And as a commercial firm, if I were wanting to use it for commercial purposes Anyone as well. can get that list, and they can get the name and the address, and they can get the voting history and the year of birth. And that's basically the information they will get. If you provide the email information so your clerk can communicate, that is not disclosed. Uh, but the basic information, name, where they live, and, and again, there is an option if someone says, well, there's someone who's stalking me, there's, there's a serious concern, I'm in law enforcement and, and I'm concerned that someone may come after me, there is an ability to become a confidential voter. Is there a form on your website for that? There is a form available <laughs> for that, yes, but you can also do it at your county clerk's office. And okay. Ultimately, uh, there has to be a check in that process because, again, we want that that integrity of the process and we try to balance that integrity in the privacy. Sure. Last question, I know we have less than a minute left. What about, you, you mentioned felonies, to check felonies. Does it make sense, uh, just uh, I'm curious philosophically, personally, to take away the right to vote for someone because they committed a crime? So in Colorado, the way it works is that during your sentence, you are not eligible to vote, but after your sentence is served, you're able to re-register and participate again. I think that does make sense. Uh, we have, you know, pick Fremont County, for example, if you allowed everybody who was incarcerated at Supermax. Right, that's Canyon City, of course, is in Fremont County. Canyon City and Fremont County. If you allowed all of those people to vote, they would actually, in some cases, have the ability to control an election uh, for local issues that they don't really impact them at all and so there is a reason why that disqualification occurs but in Colorado it's only during the period the person serving their sentence all right well um, uh, maybe uh, maybe they could be allowed to vote in their own home county or something like that would you be for that I would not be okay well fair enough good answer <laughs> good answer uh, it's a short answer not uh, bad for a politician well especially since we're out of time so that's the end of part one with Wayne uh, make sure you stay tuned for part two I'm Aaron Harbor thanks for watching